Hey folks, so recently I was talking to a student in Europe who was having a lot of trouble with bluegrass lingo, all of the words that we use. And I'm not going to single them out, but it was a great question. It's actually a question I get from lots of people, especially when they're not in the U.S. and they haven't been to a bluegrass jam. Uh, and I thought today we could just sit down and we could try to define a bunch of these bluegrass terms and help you out. I actually asked some of my students who are not in the U.S. which terms they found the most confusing and which ones they had a hard time figuring out what exactly they meant. So today... I'm going to try to answer those questions for you. Let's get started. All right, the first thing we're talking about is kicks or kickoffs. So a kickoff break is just the first break in a song. Um, so we might turn to each other and we might have conversations like, hey, do you want to kick it? My kick isn't very good. Maybe you should be the one to kick this tune. And you're like, all right, yeah, I'll kick it off. That's how we use that language. Now, it can also mean the kickoff phrase on itself. It's a little confusing, but we can also be referring to just this tiny little segment that sounds like ba ba doo da 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 Right? It's this little intro segment that gets you into a break. So, for instance, a little kickoff phrase might sound like this. All right? ba ba doo da 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 Or, bum, 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 bum. Or. Those are all kickoff phrases on their own. Now, the break that comes afterwards, like I said, if it's the very first break in the song, we might also call that on its own an entire kickoff. So a little confusing. It can refer to kind of two different things. I hope that helps you with your kicks and your kickoffs. The next one is a lick that we're talking about all the time, the Lester Flat G Run. And the Lester Flat G Run is this very famous bluegrass lick. Uh, so there's this guy, Lester Flat, um, and his associate Earl Scruggs were in a band called Flat and Scruggs, if you've never heard of them before. Before that, they played with Bill Monroe and his Bluegrass Boys. They left to start their own project. That's the very, very basic version of that story. Now, Lester Flat, being the lead singer and guitar player, he really only knew one lick and he would use that lick all the time. Maybe he knew others, but the one we remember him for is the Lester Fly G run. Supposedly, it's originally invented by Riley Puckett, and I personally believe that to be true, but Riley Puckett could have learned it from someone else as well. The lick sounds something like this. <laughs> Lester Flat would use that to end verses, to end choruses, to end other people's breaks. He would use it all the time, liberally, at the end of any section, you can toss in that G run. Um, a really good example of this is actually his guitar solo that he takes on Foggy Mountain Special, which is the same lick over and over and over again. <laughs> Here's an artist depiction of that break. <laughs> It's the Lester Flat G run. Speaking of guitar specific stuff, another one is the boom chuck. For all of the different instruments rhythm, we have these interesting terms that we use. For the guitar, it's boom chuck. Boom being the bass note and chuck being the strum. So you get this boom chuck, boom chuck, boom chuck kind of sound. Right, boom chuck, boom chuck. And that's just the sound of early bluegrass rhythm. It's still something we use today, but it has lots of different variations now. Um, if you ever hear someone refer to a chop, that's normally the mandolin that they're referring to here. So the mandolin doesn't really have any bass strings, so it doesn't really have doesn't really have a whole lot of boom potential, let's say. Um, so instead, it just chops, chop, chop. Um, if you're comparing it to the guitar terms, the mandolin really only plays on the on the chuck. When when we talk about uh, banjo players, we might talk about rolls. We might talk about single string. Talk about fiddle players. We might talk about double stops. We might talk about their bowing. All of those terms are instrument specific and. I know they can get a little convoluted. Let's not get into all of that. Let's stick with the guitar stuff. <laughs> Another term that comes up a lot is Carter style. Now, Carter style refers to this idea that we can play the melody and the chord changes at the same time. This was invented by Mother Maybell Carter of the Carter family. There's a potentially uh, exaggerated version of the story that I heard that I'll tell you. There was a recording session in Bristol, uh, Tennessee, and I believe Ralph Peer, Ralph Rinsler, Ralph Peer, it's two different Ralphs, I always mix them up. Um, I believe Ralph Peer was the recording engineer and he managed to find Jimmy Rogers and the Carter family. And so they're doing uh, the session. They're gonna record their songs, they're gonna put out records. The Carter family didn't realize that their record was gonna blow up, but it did. And they were 
like kind of the first country music superstars. Once again, super short version of that story. You can do more research on them. The possibly made up part of the story is that uh, the songs that they were recording were <laughs> were not long enough. So they asked Maybell if she could, you know, fill in with some guitar stuff. And she kind of invented the country music or bluegrass guitar solo. Like I said, that story is <laughs> probably a little bit of an exaggeration, but it's true. She did play melodies and chord changes at the same time. The one that she's probably most famous for is Wildwood Flower, and that one has become kind of a standard in the flat picking world, even if it doesn't get called at jams a lot. Kind of a, let's call that a modern Carter style. <laughs> the other slang you hear for that a lot is Carter scratch, Carter style or Carter scratch, both very common terms for that. Once again, I'm sure there's purists out there that, that will correct anything that I've said incorrectly, but that, that is the basic version of the story and that's enough to get you going. Here's a term that I actually mentioned in another part of this video, double stop. Now, double stops um, refer to playing two notes at the same time. Uh, in the classical world, the term is dyad which is not very cool. Dyad, not cool. Double stop, that's a cool word. The term double stop comes from uh, fiddle players, right, on that instrument. It is particularly difficult potentially to play two notes at the same time and to tune both of them individually. So they have a special term for it, double stops. You stop the string in two different spots and you create two different pitches and it can be difficult to play your double stops in tune. Now that term is just so useful. It's just such a good piece of language that started using it on all other instruments. <laughs> Essentially, everyone talks about double stops now, even though the term kind of comes from the fiddle. Bo 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 bonus fact, if, you, if you've never thought about this, the term uh, fiddle for like fiddling around, like you fiddle with something, of course, comes from fiddle players. In hindsight, that probably seems very obvious, but when I mention that to people, they always seem very shocked and surprised. Like they never put together the act of fiddling, playing the fiddle and fiddling with something is describing how fiddle players play with melodies. They improvise around, they fiddle with things. Bonus, bonus fun fact, the same is true for breakdown. Supposedly the etymology of that word is that, you know, breakdown being so fast that things literally fall apart was first used to describe tunes and music and eventually became a commonplace uh, term for like when your car breaks down. The term breakdown originally came from uh, country music and makes its way all the way into the common vernacular as something falling apart. But that's why breakdowns are traditionally very fast. They might break down. Cross-picking is another term that comes up a lot. Cross-picking is this idea that you can create like a banjo roll on the guitar. Now a roll for a banjo player, they play with uh, three finger picks and they have these different patterns. For instance, thumb, index, middle, thumb, index, middle, maybe thumb middle. That adds up to eight notes, that fills up a measure, eight eighth notes, for instance. Um, on a guitar, we can do a similar pattern, but since we're doing it with a pick, one of the common patterns that came up was down, down, up, down, down, up, down, up. That was sort of first done with great popularity by a guy named George Shuffler. So George Shuffler style cross picking might sound like this. consider myself a, a great cross picker, but that's perhaps an example of a simple cross picking break. Just making it up off the top of my head. Now, George Shuffler played for the Stanley Brothers, and he refers to these lean times that the band went through where they didn't have a lot of band members. And he wanted his guitar to fill up a lot of space, take up a lot of room when it was time for him to take a break or a solo. And that's how he would do it. He would try to be a banjo player. And that's where cross picking came up. In the modern day, we don't always do down, down, up. People will just alternate pick the whole pattern. But the truth about it emulating the banjo stays. It's still a pattern that tries to sound like a banjo. That's at the heart of cross picking still. A, a good place to see George Scheffler play too, and I promise I'll shut up about cross picking, is in a, a, a Rainbow Quest video with Pete Seeger. We're going to talk about Pete Seeger again too, but um, if you're not familiar with Pete Seeger's old show, you should go watch that. There's a great performance. The Stanley Brothers, George Shuffler is there. Pete Seeger talks with them and you get to see George walk around and move and do his cross picking. It's a great little piece of video. I can't define that term until I define another one first. So let's go first. A break. I never realized that this was confusing, but I, in hindsight, it's very obvious. A break is a bluegrass word for a solo. 
or an improvisation. Um, if someone asks you, do you want to take a break? They're asking if you want to take a solo. Normally in a vocal tune, if you are going to take a break, it'll be over the changes, the chord changes to the verse. If you're taking a break over a fiddle tune, that means that you're just playing through the whole form, A, A, B, B, likely, which <laughs> gives me another bonus definition there. A fiddle tune is the catch-all term for an instrumental and bluegrass. Technically, some tunes would be mandolin tunes or banjo tunes or guitar tunes, but fiddle tune has kind of become the catch-all term Term. So whether or not the tune was written on a fiddle, probably safely call it a fiddle tune if it's an instrumental, and you won't you won't get too much uh, <laughs> you won't get too much hate. The etymology of that whole thing is kind of interesting. Um, so originally it was the vocalist who's taking the break, right? Hey guys, I'm kind of tired of singing. I'm going to take five. Have fun. Um, the vocalist is on break, right? <laughs> and so suddenly there's someone soloing, um, but eventually it became the soloist who's taking the break, almost like filling the space. Uh, left by the vocalist because they're on break. It's the most confusing way to say that. I think you understand what I mean. Um, it's just an interesting change of definition for that term. But yeah, that's supposedly where the idea of a break came from. Next up, one of my favorites, the idea of a trail off. Now a trail off is when you get through all the changes of your break, all the chord changes, and you get to the end and you just keep improvising. You force everyone to wait for you to finish. And the reason why this exists is because previously, bluegrass bands would be playing around one microphone. There's still bands that do this to this day. It's, it's not even that rare. If these bands are playing around one condenser microphone, then the vocalist is in front. The vocalist has to get out of the way. So maybe a fiddle player can take their break. And when it's time for the fiddle player's break to end, well, they might have to keep improvising a little bit so everyone can rearrange again and we can get the vocalist in front again. This is also where the idea of uh, bluegrass measures came from. There's another bonus definition. A bluegrass measure is just an extra measure in the form that's not dictated by anything super specific. It's just an extra measure here or there. The, the term has become a little bit muddied. Sometimes people say bluegrass measures when they're just talking about a song that um, is a little bit crooked. We'll define crooked in a second. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Bluegrass measures are just extra measures. Let's leave it at that. Oh, and by the way, why, why did people start playing trail offs? Well, the rumor is that Bill Monroe started hiring fiddle players that played more trail offs. And so if you wanted to be hired by Bill Monroe, well, you better play the trail offs, right? You, <laughs> you better play over that possibly awkward transition moment. And so it it was kind of an evolution in how fiddle players looked at their breaks. That became uh, an important part. And eventually that rolled over to everyone. Eventually everyone was playing trail offs. All right, hot style playing. Hot style playing or hot licks is really kind of what Tony Rice and Clarence White did. Um, there's this very like bluesy, aggressive, sometimes chromatic guitar sound um, that they made really popular. And generally we call that hot style or hot licks. It's kind of a cool thing because it's taking advantage of what the guitar is well suited for. It's very easy to play bluesy things on the guitar, or chromatic things on the guitar. Sometimes, uh, for instance, with the fingering on the mandolin or on the fiddle, it's more difficult to play some of those ideas. So uh, hot style playing and hot licks is really taking the guitar and playing to its you know, advantages in a bluegrass situation. That's why it's so cool. That's why it became so popular. It was a solution to the, how do you play bluegrass guitar problem? I am not very in tune. kind of an example of hot style playing, bluesy stuff. So in the modern era, I don't think it's particularly cool to only play hot stuff. I think it's looked on as possibly a little over the top these days. So you see a lot more players that are are waiting for a really impactful moment to drop that kind of playing. So a lot of times right at the end of a break, you'll get a bunch of hot licks instead of the whole thing being this hot style playing. It's just right at the very, very end that they'll put in you know, a little explosion of that. Um, and I think that's cool. It shows more taste and reservation in the modern players. Next up, tags. Uh, now a tag in, in the pop world, if we were playing like in a wedding band, I said, hey, tag that. Generally what I mean is sing the last line of the chorus again, and then we'll be done. It's just, uh, a really standard way to end a song. That's not what we always mean in bluegrass. Um, tags in bluegrass are also just a kind of phrase, specifically this kind of phrase. Or this kind of phrase. Or this kind of phrase. All of those are famous licks, and I bet you recognized 
at least two of those. And every single one of those is an example of a tag. Now that can be how we end vocal tunes. It can be how we can end fiddle tunes, but it's also sometimes just how we end sections of a song. For instance, the A part of a fiddle tune or the B part of a fiddle tune normally ends with a tag as well. And we'll put an extra tag on the end of that fiddle tune to end it. And sometimes we even put a double tag at the end of a fiddle tune, two tags in a row. So I'm coming around the end of, uh, you know, Salt Creek maybe. Tag built into the song. And then here's my ending tag to finish it. And here's the double tag. You know, in real time. That doesn't mean that when we say tag it, we might not also be responding to that vocal thing too of just singing the last line. It depends on context. So here's a term that I promised I'd define earlier, and that term is crooked. So when something is crooked, that means that the the form doesn't work out in an expected way. So for instance, in fiddle tunes, we expect like eight measure A parts and B parts. But if something is crooked, maybe there's an extra measure. For instance, in Cherokee Shuffle, I believe the B part has 10 measures in it instead of eight. Um, or it could be something even smaller, more granular, uh, like Clinch Mountain, <laughs> Clinch Mountain Breakdown, or Clinch Mountain Backstep, excuse me. Ooh. Clinch Mountain Backstep has, um, I think, eight and a half measures in its B part, which is weird. So a quick way to communicate that to someone else would be, hey, this, this tune is crooked. Look out for this one. It's a little crooked. And that's how we explain that. Um, it's not a very in-depth explanation. It doesn't tell you what to look out for, but at least you know that that form is crooked. It doesn't tell you where it is, but that's how we explain that. Next up is the idea of mash. <laughs> so funny that I even have to explain this. Mash is <laughs> this idea that you're going to play like trad bluegrass, um, even like more modern trad stuff. Trad is just short for traditional. There's another bonus definition. Um, so <laughs> I'm going to play trad bluegrass. It's probably going to be capo fourth fret, so key of B. Uh, it's probably going to be very fast. Like a good example is like all of the bluegrass album band repertoire. A lot of that is in B flat or B. And so that stuff is easy to mash. You play it super fast, you sing really high, and if you're hanging out in a hotel at like Spigma, you're going to be doing a lot of mashing. <laughs> Here's one that uh, that someone asked me about gear, like gear in a car or gear on a bike or something. Gear is sometimes how people refer to key. So instead of saying, what key are we in? They'll say, what gear? You just respond, you know, A or B flat or B. If you're talking to another guitar player and they say, what gear? You might just tell them where to put their capo. <laughs> you might say capo second fret. Uh, but that's what people mean when they say gear. That's a short one. Potatoes. I adore this one. Or taters. Uh, potatoes or taters. This is a very not cool term for <laughs> how to kick something off. And what that refers to is this. So that's me kicking into Salt Creek, a fiddle tune using taters, I'm trying to use all the lingo at once. And taters is, is a really subtle way to say one, two, one, two, three, four. So one, two, one, two, three, four. And that's how we start the song. It's a nice way to uh, to not have to actually count, right? Everyone just knows what the taters mean and where you are. Taters. Um, so you got mash, you got taters, a lot of potato themed terms here. Someone asked me what old time was. If you're interested in bluegrass, knowing what old time is is probably pretty helpful. Old time is, is gonna get me in a lot of trouble if I try to define it casually, but I'm gonna try anyway. Old time is pre-bluegrass. American traditional music, let's say that. So if you time travel back to 1890 to hear some bluegrass, you're not gonna hear any. Instead, you're gonna hear old time. Um, they didn't call it that, obviously, but that's what it would be, it would be old time. Bluegrass doesn't really come into its own until 1945. Bill Monroe and his Bluegrass Boys with Lester Flatt and Earl Scruggs, it's like the perfect band right there. That is kind of the beginning of bluegrass, 1945. Anything before that, kind of safe to call it old time. This is such a short version of that definition, but I hope that helps. Here's one that I really like, because you already know these terms. Hammer on and pull off. Hammer on and pull off being, you know, the, the left hand move. It used to be called left hand pizzicato. 
which is an awful, awful thing to call that, <laughs> we're on a pull-off are actually bluegrass terms, or at least folk music terms. They come from Pete Seeger's banjo book, and he coined the term hammer on a pull-off. So it was a banjo instructional book that came up with those terms. They became ubiquitous. Musicians everywhere use them for whatever string instrument they play, hammer on and pull off. So there you go. There's there's some more bluegrass history and trivia. A floating, or for a banjo, how you play a melody. Floating refers to this idea of using open strings up the neck. So uh, a lick like this tag from earlier becomes this. Using all of those, all those open strings up the neck, and I'm fretting all of the fretted notes higher. And actually, there there is a um, a proper musical term for this, and a student recently told me to it, or, or told me the term rather. Um, let me let me look it up in my notes real quick. I said I wouldn't forget. I want to say that it's camp campanella campanella a steel trap up here. Yeah, in the classical world, apparently that's called campanella. So. Thank you for giving me that term, Rob. <laughs> In the bluegrass world, we call it floating. Next up, we have the concept of California grass or Berkeley grass. Sometimes these are used in a little bit of a derogatory way, <laughs> almost like it's a bad thing to be California grass or Berkeley grass. Um, if I had to describe these in a way, I associate them with being more singer-songwriter, more gentle, more like modern pop or modern folk almost like you know bedroom bluegrass uh, instead of bedroom pop um it's a it's a much more it's a much more city feeling genre it's it's much less country and that's what people tend to refer to as this berkeley grass or california grass a little more emotional probably slower songs no jim mills banjo breaks <laughs> <laughs> That's what people mean when they use that term. Um, depending on who you're talking to, that can be kind of an offensive term too. It can be kind of mean. Yet again, this is something that a student asked me, so it makes sense to put that definition out there. California grass, Berkeley grass. <laughs> In the same vein, let's talk about some of these other terms that get thrown around. You might hear someone call someone else a trad chad. <laughs> I love this. Trad as in traditional and Chad as in you know, kind of a bro. Um, they're normally seen playing bluegrass album band repertoire. Once again, they're normally mashing. <laughs> so if you want to play some mash, you should hang out with some Trad Chads. There's an idea of what you're thinking about. Also, people who use the term California grass or Berkeley grass, mostly Trad Chads. Once again, of course, that term could be kind of mean to some people. So I guess be careful how you use it. It really just depends on who you're talking to and if they like those jokes or not, I guess. Another another genre-based one that I think is a little confusing is this idea of new acoustic music or space grass or dog music. Lots of people aren't familiar with these. Space grass and new acoustic music was something that Tony Rice was using to describe a lot of his you know, weird, more out there records because he went and joined <laughs> the Grisman Quintet, which is dog music. David Grisman is the dog. That's dog music. Um, they did a lot of weird experimental fusion-y stuff. And when Tony Rice left and he started making his own records in that style, um, he started calling it space grass or new acoustic music. And I think that ETSU has a, has like a uh, student uh, space grass band, which is pretty cool. Um, but of course, Wyatt Rice teaches there. So that's Tony's brother. So that all makes a lot of sense. And I wasn't doing a particularly good job of counting, but I think that's probably about 20 definitions, um, maybe even more than 20 definitions with, with the bonus definitions that got thrown in. Uh, maybe we'll do a counter in editing and we'll see how many definitions we got in there. But uh, I hope you had a good time watching this video. I hope this clears up some of the bluegrass conversation because I know that it's hard to get in there if you don't know the words. Hopefully this helps you learn some of the words and maybe even learn some lingo that you're just not familiar with if you're not in the scene. Uh, thank you all so much for hanging out. Check out the website, LessonsWithMarcel.com for a lot of bluegrass content. I'll see you all next time. When that train comes tumbling down From the mountains cold We ring them bells at the crossroads Through the valley below